For the last year and a half, I've been gluttonously reading and watching everything Seven Deadly Sins. I've read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, 18th century monk of Agrius of Ponticus's Eight Evil Thoughts, St. Gregory's original Seven Deadly Sins coining, and the popularization of the concept with Dante's Divine Comedy, and several other books related to the mythos. All to bring you this seven-part series covering my thoughts, analysis, and opinions regarding the mythos, following each sin closely, dissecting its origins, causations, effect, and impact on pop culture and society as a whole. Keep your greedy little hands to yourself now, because coming up is the sin of greed. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy 6.10 Greed is much deeper than just a love for money. It may be the more common form of greed, but greed is better characterized as the overwhelming desire to obtain and use material and social goods. Social goods include power and status. It's a sin older than time itself, and in case of Christianity, greed provides us with the most evil character of them all, the devil. He's known by many names, but the ruler of the underworld was once an angel in Christian mythology. In fact, in Ezekiel 28 verses 12 through 15, Ezekiel writes this about Satan. Thus says the Lord God, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you, you were on the holy mountain of God, in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. To unrighteousness was found in you. Ezekiel previously wrote that a covering cherim was, in the order of angels, the closest one to God, protector of his holiness. Later, in the book of Isaiah, we learn that Satan's fall from grace was from an overwhelming desire to be greater than God. In his pursuit to obtain everything there was, he lost everything he had. In Isaiah, it said that Satan was brought down to Shul. Shul was a Hebrew word for the land of the dead. In Revelation, though, Satan is cast down to earth, and Satan's most iconic destination, hell, is mentioned in Revelation and 2 Peter as potential landings for the fallen angel. It may seem I've gone a bit off here, but as you can see, there's a lot of talk about the greedy fall of what was previously seen as one of the most perfect beings. Imagine the destruction it must cause upon mere men. Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not every man's greed. Is a quote by Gandhi. He's absolutely right, too. How is it that so few men live in excess while the many starve, many of whom prance around acting like their acts are virtuous? Profit motive is a lie, and merely an excuse to continue burying the needy underneath us. While there are millions starving, homeless, and sick, do Bezos and Musk really need another billion added to their net worth? What benefits does their Earth Escape plan do for the bottom 99%? Better yet, let's scale it down. Do you really need a $200,000 car when a $12,000 one will get you to and from work just the same? Why do you need a million dollar house with four empty rooms when the man under the bridge has his tent scooped up by the city officials? Where did man delve so deep of his own greedy ass that he thinks luxuries supersede helping his fellow man? These questions have flown through my mind for many years now. As social creatures, we have learned to have a disdain for those that are greedy. Biologically, however, we're driven by a level of greed for our own survival. When we are in need of food, water, or shelter, we're willing and biologically driven to obtain it, even if it means taking it from others. You can say what you want, but in a life or death situation, you will be driven biologically to survive. And if you're of the strong, you will do it by any means. 
However, like I said, we've adapted into social creatures. We've developed language to communicate our feelings. And societally, we have for the most part agreed that greed is bad. This shows that greed has more than just a biological component to it. Though, if confronted, many in Western society would not say that their way of life is greedy. Sadly, we're systematically encouraged to be greedy. The idea of currency transcends the existence of written history. As evidence found from archaeological excavations point towards the use of shells and beads as bartering items for goods, and possibly even services. But not every man is greedy for money, so currency couldn't possibly be the social beginnings of greed. In fact, the origins of human greed begin in a very similar fashion to that of Satan. The struggle of power. Humans as previously mentioned briefly in Gluttony, weren't built to live in the large numbers as we do now. It was due to the gradual development of social devices and structures starting with the creation of language. Language is the greatest social weapon for greed. When the structures of society began to truly emerge, sapiens took up other bands of sapiens, developing tribal identities, then developing generations of language, evolving it, molding it, and perfecting it to allow us to express ourselves to one another in complex thought. This would lead to sapiens developing more complex societal structures of leadership. Primitive forms of religion began developing, with some evidence of potential offerings to deities, maybe even art, though it's hard to say for certain. Religion, leadership, and numbers are all nasty catalysts for greed, as now the power one might covet is gaining some real headway. As these ideas, languages, and structures spread into other tribes, the tribe might grow. More people, more structure, more accumulation of power. During all this, there's a development of military tactics, possibly even basic command structures, due to the inevitability of hostile sapien tribes. Only adding to the growing structure of power. As science and social structures took more mature forms, homo sapiens would dominate the human world. Eventually, the invention of currency would become the greatest gateway to power ever. Uh, eventually. Nobody could obtain this currency in massive amounts in its infant stages. Commodity currency, or food, beads, shells, etc., would be used at first. As you would imagine, this form of lugging around pounds of these commodities would become quite burdensome. So, representative currency, uh, like the shekel, would be invented. Even further would be the invention of fiat currency, or a currency without any commodity backing it at all, just to guarantee that you can use said currency. More than likely, you have some form of fiat currency in your pocket or bank account right now. There's plenty of resources and courses talking about currency, so if you want to know more, it's best to seek those out, otherwise I could go on for another hour on just currency alone. The point I'm trying to come across here is, greed is more than money, and money is far from the root of evil much less all evil. Homo sapiens <laughs> arrogantly believe we invented greed, but we just merely perfected it. Out of Aristotle's virtues and vices, it was hard to choose, but I think ambition and pettiness take some elements of greed. Ambition as a whole isn't a vice, but the excessivity of it in Aristotle's eyes is. He directly linked the feeling of honor and dishonor into this vice. If one's honor was viewed in excessively ambitious ways, one might have a lust for power, one where the individual most likely believes they're deserving of special treatment, worship, power, and even money. The reason I think this doesn't fall in with pride is because this is considered the minor vice. The major vice of feelings of honor and dishonor is vanity. Pettiness is the aspect of greed in regards to hoarding resources. In this case, money for Aristotle. A reluctance to not spend any money isn't virtuous in Aristotle's eyes because generosity is the accompanying virtue. Generosity perfectly describes my ideal usage of money. One spends on themselves their basic needs and desires and shares the excess with the others. Evagrius also shares these exact same thoughts, having listed out seven virtues to accompany his eight deadly thoughts. Charity and generosity are the accompanying virtue to the deadly thought of greed. Generosity and charity, much like greed, expands upon the realm of currency. I say this because it's rather easy to think exclusively in financial sense. These virtues are meant to extend into your very character. 
Being generous in action and the spread of power and selfless charitable acts are all pinnacles of living virtuously according to Aristotle, Evagrius, and myself. One should find themselves selfishly acting for the joy of generosity and charity. That joy derives from a place of communal camaraderie. You don't build community on top of selfish greed and hoarding valuable life-saving resources. You build it on bringing a helping hand to those you can. To overextend and pull yourself into the tar pit is also unvirtuous in the eyes of somebody like Aristotle. I personally think it's down to personal mindset. One might find themselves detached enough to let it all go in the name of helping others. I personally couldn't, but I find a great deal of respect for somebody who could hold such a mindset. It's really hard for us to imagine a world without the modern luxuries we're given. But to even think back to a time even 100 years ago, in 1922, only around 57.3% of Americans had electricity. Today in America, over 85% of people own a smartphone. Given the drastic advancement in tech in such a comparatively short time to the whole of human history, it's easy to get caught up in all the insanity and forget. We've been born in an era and place in the world with the privilege to access the internet freely, while so many others don't even have access to adequate shelter, water, and food. All resources that we produce in excess in the name of growing profit margins. As we came from greed, what we produce thrives on it. Greed has been injected into the very blood of our nations and businesses, and I'm guilty myself. Greed is again an innate survival trait for humans, so lapses in behavior are only natural. Nobody is meant to achieve perfection while living virtuously. That being said, greed can be hard to catch on to, at least for your average American. If we have enough money to buy excessive luxury items, we more than certainly have enough money to care for our fellow man. As simple as donating cans of food to homeless shelters, helping a friend in need, or giving back to your community to the greatest of your abilities. Nevertheless, in the micro, in the day-to-day -day decisions, there may be no escape from greed at all. Almost every decision is made out of some level of greed. It's sad because greed is a sin that can leave the sinner virtually unharmed if done correctly. Greed tends to harm those around the greedy, such as slavery and fascism rising out of excessive greed for power over others. Economic greed is child's play to what greed can actually bestow upon man. Avoiding greed is a matter of value for your fellow man. If you value your fellow man, you avoid the pitfalls of hoarding power and wealth from him. You instead look to each other when in need, because it's beneficial for both of your survival, perhaps even thriving. A man who is truly the worst form of greed is one who takes without concern. He amasses all the treasures of life for himself. However, generosity is a virtue on its own, and being overly generous is also, at least in the eyes of someone like Aristotle, an excessive vice. I personally think over generosity is hard to place for some. As long as you're not allowing yourself to be taken advantage of by your generosity, I think the level of your charitability is dependent on the kind of life you wish to live. After all, there are those in the world who give their entire lives to charitable causes, and they enjoy it. However, some may find that losing a certain level of comfort in life would be a breaking point for generosity, and there's no shame in that either. Everyone's level of selflessness varies greatly. What matters though is that you're not being stingy with your power and wealth in your community. Greed is an ever relevant sin, especially in the modern era. We speak of the massive wealth disparity in the world massive nations encroaching on one another in territorial disputes, and the common man essentially footing the bill for it all. This cycle isn't new in history. Greed's wheel has turned since the inception of survival itself. It's nearly impossible to think of a world without it at times, but perhaps exactly what we need for the survival of man as we greedily continue the march of silical climate change on Earth. Not that it hurts Earth as a planet, but for most of the biological life on Earth, it could get a little deadly. It could even be seen as a greedy move for the one percenters to try and preserve the earth for the prosperity of man and their power and wealth. 
However, it seems we still mostly only care about everlasting growth of GDP. It's a deadly sin after all. Humanity is most likely to fall to greed in my opinion. Like Muhammad Gandhi said, Earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, but not every man's greed. Greed perhaps was always the destined end for man. Unless one of our other deadly sins gets to us first. Hey, thanks for watching part 2 of this 7 part series. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so that you can catch the other parts as they come, along with more content to come here on the CISA. Y'all have a good one now.